for the next uh, few months, at least, uh, I'm going to be uh, committing or self-committing to uh, more regular postings uh, about every other week. And that's uh, part of my, um, my thrust of some research that I'm doing regarding aesthetic theology and embodiment. Uh, I've wanted to work on this kind of stuff for a while and hadn't uh, had it kind of pop into a place where it made sense for me to be doing it until this spring. So uh, as I finish books in my reading list on this topic, uh, I will be kind of reflecting on them and making videos. Um, it coincides with a couple of folks who had gotten in touch with me and asked, how come I don't post anything anymore? So conveniently, I'm now going to be doing all this. Uh, and I'll be doing it along with uh, Mark Brummett, who is a friend and a professor uh, of Old Testament at uh, Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School here in Rochester, where I'm also um, slow boating my way through some uh, degreeage. So uh, he and I will be reading together, and I hope some of you will be interested in reading along too, or at least reading some of the stuff, or maybe you've read it before. So I'll post the book list below. And if you're interested in hopping in on that conversation, well, then let me know. Um, it would be great to kind of be conversing with you as well. Uh, to get started, um, I, I thought I wanted to um, kind of articulate a little bit about why this is appealing to me. And that is rooted in the work that I have done uh, and the research and stuff uh, regarding theopoetics, the thesis of which for me at its core is that how we articulate our experience of the divine can change that experience of the divine. So that um, depending on how we express and we allow ourselves and we encourage and engender other people to express God, their experience of what God is and how God is moving in the world, or if God is moving in the world, shifts and can become uh, more vibrant and be, be deadened in some cases. Um, and so I wanted them to look at uh, articulations of experience and perceptions of experience. And uh, in some cases, judgments uh, uh, of perceptions of experience in terms of uh, aesthetics then around beauty and, and taste. And of course, the impact that these things, these experiential items have on our theology. How is it that we think that God is moving in the world? Uh, and off the bat, already some of my assumptions about uh, the way things are have been challenged. Um, and for me, uh, one of the uh, key things that kind of drew my interest to the topic was saying, well, if it's about uh, taste, preference, aesthetics, um, then it's about embodiment. Uh, and uh, off the bat, boom, that's incorrect. Uh, and... So that's worth getting into. I'm going to talk a little bit about this a great essay called Aesthetic Embodiment. And um, then we'll be wrapping up this little video. So uh, I kicked off with this essay by a guy named Arnold um, Berlant. And he happens to be a graduate in the 50s from the Eastman School of Music here in Rochester, New York. I've never met him. But he had this great essay called uh, Embodied Aesthetics. Or it's that aesthetic embodiment, excuse me. And uh, he is a musicologist and a philosopher, it seems, dealing with aesthetics. And the essay is wonderful. It's also linked below. He never articulates that this is what he's doing. But it seems to me that the whole of his essay is uh, anti-Kantian. And uh, I want to say a little bit about that before I go into some of the particular content of the Berlin essay. Now, Kant, in his critique of judgment, uh, and that's going to be linked uh, on the image of fish uh, to the Stanford Encyclopedia, uh, Philosophical Encyclopedia. But um, two pieces that are relevant there uh, in terms of Berlant's essay. One, Kant says that beauty, an assessment, a judgment of beauty, um, has to be on its own merits, not because it's pleasurable. That is, um, you can like a uh, flower and it brings you pleasure. Yeah, but... but the fact that the flower br brings you pleasure does not make it beautiful. Alternatively, if something is beautiful, kind of externally and, and disconnected from you, if, if it possesses the quality of beauty and it brings you pleasure, that's fine. But you can't say that something is beautiful because it brings you pleasure. So that's one distinction that Kant makes about beauty. 
And another that he makes um, is that beauty cannot be about utility. And in fact, he says pure um, beauty, kind of in its utmost form, uh, is is without utility. And the famous example there is he says a sunset or a sunrise, that it is not useful for something. It simply is beautiful, as opposed to, for example, um, like a, a fancy sports car or something, which is the modern marvel of machinery, and it's so good at being a sports car. You say, wow, what a beautiful car. Uh, I think Kant would say, no, no, you're talking about utility there. Um, it's really good at being a car. It's, it's goodness and you, its great utility at being a car doesn't make it beautiful. Beauty as a philosophical and aesthetic category uh, for Kant is kind of, is utility-less and is just separated and is something about the, the, the perceived object itself. Uh, now this type of thinking uh, is what Berlant, his essay, identifies as dualistic, right? That somehow this type of consciousness of uh, being able to be distanced from the, the thing being perceived and, and adequately and accurately uh, identify and discern its qualities or level of beauty uh, is a function of a kind of dualism as if our experience and, and thinking was somehow separate from the body. Uh, Berlant says that's a mistake, that this type of consciousness, which is kind of the way that Kant thinks about it, I think, uh, is in fact in the body. Our consciousness does not exist without the body. Uh, and he's got some really choice quotes that I think are are really great. Rather than this kind of cold, distant, aesthetic quality of appreciation, uh, Berlant uh, cites some other ways of thinking about it. Uh, this is Herbert Gunther. It says, in aesthetic perception, the work of art remains alive. It calls out to be felt and touched, and each part of it is perceived as if it were for the moment all of the world unique, desirable, perfect not needing something other than itself in order to be itself. In this experience, there is the warmth of closeness, not the coldness of distance. I think that that is exactly the kind of thing that we're after here. And so to kind of bridge these parallels, too much of theology tries to articulate itself the way that Kant wants to be talking about beauty. That is, it's distant, um, sure, objective, and uh, is true regardless of the context and the content and its utility. It just is the case. I say uh, bah humbug to that and say, no, it's all about the fleshly experience, the context in which the, the viewer is receiving it or, or the congregant is hearing it, and it matters to the flesh. And in fact, good theology or a good theopoetic is one which engage. It, it brings about this experience and this warmth of closeness, not the coldness of distance, kind of an abstraction. Uh, and he, uh, Berlant also goes through some, some things regarding Merleau-Ponty, where Merleau-Ponty talks about the self uh, as part of a, the body world. So rather than a fixed uh, subjective, objective self, world, um, Merleau-Ponty talks about a charged field. That is, there is something that is particular about the self and the world, but it's not so rigid as to say self-world, self-observing, self-making objective um, aesthetic judgments. Merleau-Ponty instead um, says that the, the charged field is a, a pregnant phrase. It suggests that energy reaches out not outside, but outward. And the body then is just a concentration of forces that's part of this field. In fact, this isn't a body, but it's a self. The eye is a charged field. So there's this feeling of kind of interaction and, and permeability regarding the kind of self-identification and the identification of, of the world which is to be perceived. So it's not nearly as divided or split or dual um, as um, kind of Cartesian thought and in here, in terms of aesthetics, I would say um, Kantian thought has, has it be. Um, and I think that this is, this is a good place, that, that Kant, um, kind of arguably one of the most important um, philosophers of the past, oh, few hundred, um, 
has aesthetics um, so separate from the flesh, at least as far as I can tell, um, is unfortunately, I think, par for the course in terms of modernism as a project. Um, scientism, rationalism has been extended over and even beyond the experience of the body into our own ways of assessing and articulating preference and experience of of the, the aesthetic world, the, the whole of the world. And what I'm much more interested in uh, is the kind of thinking that uh, Berlant is articulating, the kind of thinking that um, drives us to understand ourselves as part of the world, that understands our perceptions to be uh, absolutely influenced, that our, that our tastes are driven by those things that are around us. And even something like beauty, or I'll go so far as to say uh, goodness, in that the beauty is sometimes good, um, is a contextual thing. It's a fleshly experiential thing. And I am eager to see um, how that pans out um, as I move forward. So uh, it's a great essay. I would take a, a gander at it if if I were you. But then again, if I were you, I'd be me, and I've already read it. So there's that. Uh, I hope that some folks are interested in taking this ride uh, with me and us, and I will see you when I do.